Hello, welcome to another lecture for my class, PSYC 440-640 Experimental Methods. The class that sounds like it's about research methods and is a little bit, but is really more a class about research data analysis, especially emphasizing univariate approaches and the model comparisons approach to analysis. And as I normally do, I'm beginning with a web comic. This is a classic from xkcd.com. Uh, talking about correlation and causation. And it's appropriate today because this is the first lecture of Unit 2, the lecture, I'm sorry, the unit where I um, begin to really introduce and deepen the discussion of multiple correlation and regression analysis. Um, it's obviously the lecture where I introduce bivariate correlations. Now, if you're enrolled in my class or if you're watching this video on YouTube and you're not enrolled in my class, you've almost certainly encountered correlations before, so a lot of what I'll present in this lecture will probably be a review, but that's okay. Um, learning statistics is, as I think I said in my first lecture, kind of a Sisyphusian task, or at least it seems that way to me sometimes, and review and revisiting and reworking is, um, is often beneficial and hopefully interesting as well. And with that in mind, let's review just briefly uh, what we covered in Unit 1. Uh, unit one of this of this class uh, could be called descriptive statistics. Uh, I, I tried to introduce some uh, basic ideas about the research process, about research design and research methods. I tried to talk about the idea of building statistical models and comparing them one to the other. But when we get down to a lot of the calculations uh, that we made, um, much of it was like the stuff that you'd encounter in a statistics textbook in the chapter or two at the beginning on descriptive statistics, ways in which we can quantify different features of the sample of data we have and begin to think a little bit beyond that sample to the population of data that the sample comes from. Unit 2 kind of builds on that and begins to talk more about relationships between variables. Now, this of course is important if when we're studying almost anything, especially this type of stuff that we study in psychology and the behavioral sciences, because we're interested in trying to understand to what extent two or more variables change along with each other, or to what extent uh, one variable can be predicted from another, and so on and so on. And by the way, another classic comic here from XKCD. Um, so using that idea, looking at relationships between variables, let's move on and talk a little bit about correlations. Correlations really are about ways, or are one of uh, the ways that we can talk about measuring relationships. And I'll introduce them, but first introduce covariation, talk about correlation, talk about effect sizes, and also some of the problems that can come up with um, measurements of relationships uh, between variables, particularly things like restriction of range. And then towards the end of this lecture, I'll talk a little bit about hypothesis testing with correlations. We did a little bit of hypothesis testing by making confidence intervals and error bars and such back in unit one, but there the focus was mostly on uh, statistics that describe central tendencies of groups of data, particularly the mean. So we'd make like a confidence interval around a mean and ask, does that interval overlap with a predicted value or does it overlap with an interval from another mean? Same idea, except now we're applying it to correlations and there are only a couple extra twists that are necessary to take in order to make that connection. Hopefully I'll help you make that connection if you don't already know it in this lecture today. Okay, so measuring relationships. Here we see on this uh, page just a, a humble scatter plot describing some anonymous variables, presumably a predictor variable on the x-axis and an outcome variable on the y-axis. And we might well wonder if these are our data in a study we're doing, what's the relationship between these two variables? Now, we can describe relationships in terms of two fundamental features. That first feature is the direction of the relationship. Is the relationship between the two variables positive? That is, does one variable ascend in values as the other variable ascends in values? Or does it descend in value as the other variable descends in value? Um, is the relationship negative? Is it the case that as one variable ascends in value, the other descends in value or vice versa? Or is there no real discernible direction in the relationship? So that's one feature of relationships between variables, direction. The other feature is magnitude. Is this relationship strong? That is, is the positive or negative relationship relatively tight? Um, or is it weak or diffuse? Or is there indeed kind of no uh, discernible relationship there at all? 
So measuring relationships can be thought of in terms of describing direction and magnitude. So if we want to describe the direction and magnitude of a relationship, one way we could do that is by computing the covariance or a numerical estimate of the covariation between two variables. And you've certainly encountered covariance in other classes before, but a, a twist that may be new to you is I want to show or highlight the connection between covariance and variance, um, a uh, measure of dispersion that we talked about in unit one. So recall that variance is just the average amount the data varies from a mean or the, you know, or calculated as the average of squared deviations. Here's the formula. Um, again, technically this isn't an average because we're dividing by n minus one, but you get the basic idea. And what's important to note here is we could take that uh, squared parenthetical term and we could you know, unpack it so it's just two um, deviations multiplied by each other, as you can see on the bottom there. I'm just gonna highlight one of those. And the reason I'm doing that is I'm gonna substitute in another value for that one of those parenthetical values as you can see right here and that gives me the formula for covariance now you may have encountered covariance before in another class or you almost certainly have and you may have encountered the formula but what's interesting to note is the similarity between the formula for variance and the formula for covariance that's because covariance is giving us an average of the amount of variation in one variable that's accompanied by variation in another variable. And this is computed as the average of cross product deviations here. So we take the amount that each individual data point on the X uh, variable um, differs from the mean on the X variable and the amount that that data point differs on the Y variable from the mean of the Y variable, multiply them together, add them all up, take the N minus one average and we have covariance. Note here that in the formula for covariance, like in the formula for variance, we're dividing by n minus one. Um, and by way of a quick review, the reason we're doing this is because of the issue of degrees of freedom. We can think of degrees of freedom different ways, as you recall. One way is to think about it in terms of the number of observations in a data set that are free to vary. In this case, the observations I'm talking about are data points that are dis defined by two variables or values on two variables, that is, a value on x and a value on y. So if you uh, slide the video back to the scatter plot, obviously you see a series of dots and kind of a cloud on a two-dimensional plane. Each of those dots has a value for x and a value for y. They are each observations in the sense that we're making in our data set. What's this idea of free to vary really mean? Well, if we were computing covariance in just the sample, that is, we weren't trying to use the sample of data as a way of estimating um, values in a population of data, then we could divide by the uh, denominator of just n, not n minus one. That's because in this case, we're comparing each data point to a mean from that sample. And we're not trying to estimate uh, any values in a population. So the value for that mean could really be anywhere. Um, it could, you know, the value for the mean of X and the mean of Y, uh, just depending on whatever the values of the data in that particular sample are. So you could imagine here's a scatter plot of data. It's just a sample. We're not interested in the population it came from. And the mean of X and the mean of Y is some point somewhere in this cloud, either overlapping with one of those dots or not. And from sample to sample to sample, it's gonna be slightly different, but we don't really care. Uh, and we're not particularly interested in how that value, that sort of center, mean X, mean Y, um, indicates or estimates anything in a population. So again, we're describing the data and each data point, each little X and Y data point is free to vary. It can be anywhere. Um, so we take the average by simply dividing by N to of the, take the average of the cross, summed up cross products um, to figure out the covariance in just the sample. Now, let's think about a situation in which we're looking to estimate the covariance between two variables in the population, which by the way is what we're typically doing. We typically do care about the covariance between variables in the population of data. 
Here, we're going beyond the data we have in our sample. We have each data point is being compared to a sample mean, but that sample mean is meant to estimate a population mean, mu x and mu y. So if we go back to the idea of our scatter plot, here again we have a sample of data and um, there is a, a value of, um, of the mean for the variable x mean for the variable y. Um, but that value for the mean is meant to estimate the mean x and the mean y in the population of data. Now we don't know exactly where that value is, but we're using our sample mean point as an estimate of that population mean point. Again, the idea here is that we're going beyond the data, and all the data in our sample can vary except for that last data point, which in a sense gets locked into position uh, with respect to the population mean. So the population mean has some value, even though we don't know what it is, uh, which means in principle every data point, every observation in our data set could be any particular value except for a single last one, which would then have to have a particular value in order for mean x, mean y to perfectly estimate mu x, mu y. So again, this is why we're adjusting our average, dividing by n minus 1, to reflect that restricted nature of our data. It has less freedom to move. It has less degrees of freedom. Hopefully this makes sense to you, but if it doesn't, another way to think about this is to consider our general formula for degrees of freedom, where we have the number of data points in our data set minus, minus the number of necessary relationships. We often express this as df equals n minus r. In this case, r is 1, again, because each data point, that is each little x, y, has a necessary relationship with the mean, x mean y, when that value is used to estimate the population mean. Anyway, I hope that makes sense. If not, don't worry too awful much because we will return to degrees of freedom again and again throughout the course of this semester because they are kind of a tricky topic or they can be a little bit difficult to understand. Let's move on then, or move on a little bit and get back to talking about covariation. Um, you might be wondering at this point, well, you know, obviously we, we compute covariance. Covariation is kind of interesting to us. Why is that exactly or what's so important about it? Well. Just remember that in psychology and in many behavioral sciences, indeed in most sciences just generally speaking, we're often interested in causal relationships between variables, between predictor variables and outcome variables. And way back in unit one at some point, I talked about the three criteria which are typically used to make judgments about the nature or sort of the presence of a causal relationship. If we want to make a claim that uh, one variable is causing another, we look for temporal precedence, which is largely a matter of the way our study is designed and how we are gathering our measurements. And then we also look at things like covariation and non-spuriousness. So there you have it right there. Covariation is a really important uh, criterion to consider when making judgments about causality. And with that in mind, um, the author of our textbook, Andy Field, in his book, Discovering Statistics Using SPSS, uses a very simple example of this where um, we're looking at a relationship between a predictor variable, advertising, and an outcome variable, purchases of candies. So something that I think we can all sort of enjoy. Candy is, is nice. I'm probably getting a little hungry here as I record because it's right before lunch, so the thought of eating something sugary is appealing. Now imagine we have a really small data set. There are only five cases in it, which of course is ridiculously small. It's a very small consumer survey. And for each person in this data set, we have data on the number of advertisements they watched for a particular brand of candy, let's say, within the last week. And we also have data for the uh, number of uh, packages of candy that the person purchased. So very, very simple. We are maybe testing a claim that there's a causal relationship between the amount of advertisement you watch and the number of purchases you make. Um, part of that claim rests upon the covariation between these two variables. Let's explore that covariation. Now, you almost certainly can calculate covariation, covariance, um, just in SPSS or even on a scientific calculator, but let's imagine you wanted to do it in Excel and you wanted to kind of do it by hand, so to speak, like go through all the steps. If you were doing this, you would enter the data into, or you could enter the data into Excel as I've done here for each of my people. Um, and then I could compute 
each of the deviations uh, for each person from the mean uh, on each variable. So I have values for ads and packets purchased for each person, and I have for each person the amount for which the amount by which his or her ads um, number of ads views deviates from the mean for that variable and number of packets purchased deviates from the mean for that variable. So again, if you look at person one here, you can see that he watched five ads or she watched five ads. That's slightly less than the mean for that variable and uh, purchased eight packets of candy. That's also slightly less than the mean for that variable. So I've created the deviations um, for each variable and then I've multiplied them to create the cross product deviation there in the final column. I've summed these all up and I've divided by n minus one and that gives me my covariation. Again, this average of cross product deviations. Now, clearly that's a lot of work to compute covariance. And as you might already know, uh, SPSS, or you might already guess, SPSS, I'm sorry, Excel has uh, a function that allows you to get basically the same uh, calculation really easily. And that is just equals covariances.s because we're using a sample of data from the population and we just enter as the two arguments for that function, the first column of data adds, and then the second column of data packets purchased, and that gives us the covariance of the two. So we can do the calculation by hand, so to speak, or we can do all the steps. We can have SPSS use, uh, gosh, a second time I made that mistake, we can have Excel uh, use a function, or we can even use the data analysis tool pack uh, if we have it installed in Excel. So just opening up data analysis tool pack, there's a little tool for covariance. We enter uh, an input range, which includes uh, the columns for both of our variables. We enter, we enter an output range. That's just a place where Excel can put the results of the calculation. Now, if you use the data analysis tool pack, it will produce for you a little table like the one that you see at the bottom of, of my screen uh, shot here, um, which is just giving us a two by two table for the relationship between uh, ads watched and packets purchased. Um, on the diagonal of this little table, we have the variances of each of those two variables. And on the off diagonal, we have the covariance between the two variables. Now, if you look closely, you might be wondering why are these values or why is this value of 3.4 different than the values that we computed earlier, 4.3, 4.25. Um, well, the reason for that is that when we did the computation by hand, that is going through all the steps, or when we use the covariance.s function, we used n minus one in our denominator because we were trying to estimate covariance in the population. Um, we we're using, in a sense, covariance based on a sample um, to estimate covariance in a population. The covariance tool in the tool pack just uses n as, um, as the denominator. Um, it's like trying to estimate the covariance of two uh, variables in an entire population of data, not using the data as a sample uh, of a larger population, but treating it as the entire population. Um, for what it's worth, there's actually a different function in Excel called covariance.p that does the same thing. Now, the point of me bringing this up right now is not to sort of spend a lot of time obsessing about the minutia of how Excel functions are set up, but just to note that this can make a difference in your calculations, especially when the sample size is so tiny. You know, you can imagine if our sample size was very large, you know, 500 uh, cases or 500 people, then the difference between n and n minus one would be trivially small. But in a small sample, it can make a difference. Maybe more importantly, it's valuable to have some understanding of what your tools are doing or what your statistical analytic tools are doing when you use them. Um, you know, conceivably, if you weren't aware of this, this fact in this particular case and you were using the tool pack, you might make a mistake just because you didn't really understand how the tool pack was doing its work. Um, again, not super important for this uh, example, but maybe just a general lesson to pay attention to as we move forward and do more complicated analyses in either Excel or in SPSS. So what covariance is really telling us then is the average amount that variation in one variable is accompanied by variation in another variable. So if we use the data from the book's example, and indeed 
use this image from the textbook, which I've copied out, um, we can create a kind of a representation of this covariation. Here on the x-axis, we have put each uh, participant or each case's ID number, and on the y-axis, we've put their uh, value on each of the two variables. And we've also drawn some lines to indicate where the means are. And the covariation is kind of giving us a sense of whether as one variable deviates from the mean, uh, is it the case that the other variable deviates from the mean as well? Or, or is it the case that there's a strong relationship between those two? So for instance, for most of these people, in fact, I guess for all of these people, if they're below average on the one variable, they're also below average on the other variable as well. There's a covariation between advertisements watched and packets of candy purchased. So we can calculate covariation in any of a number of different ways. And covariation is valuable because it tells us if there's a positive or a negative relationship uh, between these two variables. In this case, there's a positive covariation. If you're above the average on one variable, you tend to be above the average on the other variable. Or below average on one variable, you tend to be below average on the other variable. What covariation doesn't really give us is a sense of the magnitude of that relationship. It's, it's not easy, at least not easy for me, to eyeball a covariation and have a sense of whether it's particularly big or particularly small. So what we can do to resolve this problem or give us more information that's a little bit more useful is to compute, of course, a correlation. Correlation is just a common, um, <clears throat> uses common units for different measures, specifically standard deviations. So if we divide covariation by the product of the standard deviations for our two variables, we have the correlation between those two variables, which we can either express as you see here, or we can kind of draw out all the algebra uh, as you see below. Either way, what we're talking about is correlation. And the only reason I'm including these formulas right now is because you've probably encountered the formula for correlation in other textbooks. And maybe what you didn't immediately notice uh, is that what it really is is just covariation standardized. So in our case here, <clears throat> we can take one of our calculations of covariation uh, estimated in the population and divide it by the product of the standard deviations and we get a value for the correlation between our two variables. And of course, we don't need to do this by hand or do the steps ourselves. We can take advantage of a formula that exists in Excel. In fact, there are actually a couple different formulas that'll do this. I'm just using Corel because it's the easiest one for me to remember. Corel is a function that takes two arguments, which just like the covariation function, are each uh, are ranges for each of the two variables, as you can see here. And indeed, there is in the uh, data analysis tool pack, also a function for correlation. What we're calculating here is technically called the Pearson product moment correlation. And it gives us a sense of the direction of a relationship between two variables and also the magnitude of the, very, of the relationship between two variables. Because as you of course know from other classes, correlations can range from a value of negative one up to zero and up to positive one. In this particular case, the correlation is 0.87, which tells us that the correlation, the relationship between the two variables is both positive and also rather strong because it's pretty close to the upper bound of what a correlation can be. At this point, I think it's fun to uh, play a game to visualize correlations. Um, this is something I do in class. There are a number of these little web apps that are available. Um, if you're in my class, I've linked to a few of them, or at least one of them on Blackboard. If you're not, just go to Google and type in guess correlation or guess the correlation. You'll probably find a few of them. This is just one of them. If you refresh the page or click the button for new scatter plot, it'll give you randomly generated data and you just have to take a guess as to what the correlation is and then it checks your guess. Um, the only reason I, I, I'm bringing this up now, one is it's kind of fun, I guess. If you good way to waste a bit of time, but also I think it's kind of handy to um, constantly try to relate calculations that we might make, for instance, calculations of correlation to um, geometric representations of what the data looks like. Uh, that's not always possible, or, or certainly as we get to more and more complicated analyses, visualizing them becomes rather difficult, but as best as we can, I think it's nice to put a picture to a calculation, and this is just one sort of fun way for us to do that.
As we're measuring relationships, uh, I've already talked about the idea of describing the direction and the magnitude of relationships. We can actually take that second point, magnitude, a little bit further and calculate the coefficient of determination, which is just the portion of variance in one variable that's associated with variance in another variable. Um, it's just the bivariate correlation squared. So if we take r, r, you know, little r and square it, we get big R squared, which in this case is 0.76. And it's just telling us that about 70, about three quarters of the variance in one variable is associated with variance in, another, in the other variable, which I think is uh, you know, fairly easy to intuitively kind of understand. Indeed, it's worth noticing that correlations or squared correlations are kind of easy ways of thinking about effect sizes. And at least in psychology and other behavioral sciences, we have some kind of rough benchmarks that we use for evaluating correlations. So we sometimes will talk about a correlation of 0.5 as representing a large effect or a large relationship uh, between two variables, you know, two scales on um, two different surveys or uh, you know, an observed relationship between a particular predictor variable and a particular outcome variable. I should say at this point that it's worth noticing that a so-called large effect really is only representing 25% of the variance in one variable being associated with variance in another variable. So in a way, uh, our large effects in psychology aren't really all that large. And the more common so-called medium effect sizes, you know, correlations of 0.3 or so, reflect barely, or not even, 10% of the variance in one variable being associated with variance in another variable. Um, I don't bring that up to shame psychology, but again, I think it's important for us to not just make calculations, like in this case, calculations of R or R squared, but to kind of think about and if possible, visualize what those calculations represent. Maybe the important point I'm kind of circling around here is that correlations are effect sizes, and I think they're fairly easy to think about and visualize. I, I have an easier time thinking about correlations than I do thinking about you know, Cohen's D or Hedges G, although those are not that hard to think about. Um, I would also encourage you um, to check out, if you're in my class, I've linked to the blog R Gets Psychologist, uh, which is a blog by a, um, a guy who's a PhD candidate, I think, uh, and also a rather good computer programmer in R and uh, I guess in HTML or whatever people use nowadays to program websites, um, a little visualizer for visualizing the relationship between correlations, um, or I, I'm sorry, uh, in terms of visualizing the magnitude of correlations. Here you can slide the slider back and forth, uh, which will result in correlations that are stronger or weaker, and the little Venn diagram will slide over more or less to indicate portions of overlapping uh, variance. Um, again, if you're in my class, I've linked to this. If not, um, it's uh, it's fairly easy to find. Um, I'll try, try and find a link or place a link in a future uh, lecture. Okay, so if you're in my class at this point, or if you're playing along, um, I will uh, link to a, a data set of some fake data that I've made up uh, for the following scenario. Imagine you're a health psychologist studying sleep. You have a predictor variable, which is just a, a simple measure of average daily sleep quality. Let's just assume that the scale runs from zero, which means really poor sleep, up to 10, which means really good sleep. I have young children, so I think I would score pretty low on this uh, variable. We have an outcome variable that is academic performance from, again, really poor to really good. Now, if you're in my class, I've linked to this data. If not, you know, just play along. Um, you could find or make your own data. What I want you to do is just compute the covariation and the correlation, try some different methods, you know, do all the steps, use an Excel function, play around with the tool pack, and see if you can fairly quickly describe for the relationship between these two variables, both the direction and the magnitude of that relationship. Should be pretty easy for you, but again, sometimes a little bit of practice can be important and can be helpful. Moving on, let's talk a little bit about some of the problems uh, that can come up when people are computing uh, correlations or covariances to describe relationships between two variables. Um, one of these is restriction of range problems. Uh, correlations um, are based on means, and of course, you know, they're based on the mean of the one variable and the mean of the other variable, and they work best when we have a full range of values for those two different variables. So here is some 
just data that was generated on a website that I found, where we have a correlation of 0.7 between two variables, predict variable x and outcome variable y. If we start restricting the range of this data, so restricting the range on x, sort of chopping out all the low data on the x variable, you can see that the correlation changes. We can also kind of create an opposite effect where we chop out data on the middle and just have extreme values on x and on y. There's actually um, a little example of this that you can find on the internet really easily the, called Ebbs Anscombe's quartets. These are just quartets or groups of four sets of data that may have very different arrangements but all have the same correlation. So in this case the correlation happens to be 0.82 but you can see in all four of these examples data that are arranged quite differently, in some cases quite strangely. Um, there's another web app um, for Epsom's Quartet here where you can sort of play around uh, with data. I've linked to this in the Blackboard site for my class to see how you can get data that have different sorts of arrangements but can have similar or even identical correlations. The point of all of this is that you should always try to inspect your data looking for odd shapes, weird distribution, outliers, and etc. Um, and be aware that things like restrictions of range can affect calculations of correlations as well as other calculations of different statistics as well. Again, look at your data before you do your calculations. It's usually a really good idea. Okay, so in the next section of the lecture now, I'm going to turn to the topic of hypothesis testing. And using our little example, we could ask whether the observed correlation between advertisements watched and candies purchased is significantly different from zero. If we want to use the language and the logic of null hypothesis significance testing, we could make a null hypothesis that in the population there is no difference, um, that there is no correlation between uh, these variables, or there's uh, no difference between the correlation and zero, it's equivalent. Um, and we could have an alternate hypothesis that there, there is some correlation uh, between these variables, or the, the difference between the correlation and the population and zero is something. You know, there's some value to express that difference. Now what we normally do when we uh, approach hypothesis testing kind of from this angle is we compute a sample um, or test statistic and then we determine the likelihood of our statistic as sampling distribution under the null hypothesis and depending on that likelihood, that probability value, we make a decision to either reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. That likelihood of the given uh, statistic that we've calculated depends on the shape of the sampling distribution. Now, in the case of most uh, sample and test statistics, the shape of that sampling distribution depends on the size of their sample. Larger samples tend to have more regular and normal shaped sampling distributions, but it doesn't depend on the size of the statistic that we've calculated. So, you know, the sampling distribution for a mean that is very large is not different than the sampling distribution for a mean that is very small, provided that the sample sizes of each of those calculations are the same. Or, you know, another example would be that the sampling distribution for a t statistic depends on the number of cases in the sample, but it doesn't depend on how big or how small that t statistic is. The problem here is that in the case of correlations, the sampling distribution uh, for correlations varies with the magnitude of correlations. It changes not just as a function of sample size, but also as a function of correlation size, and that's problematic, or at least it requires some additional consideration on our part. Just to kind of further, uh, you know, visualize that, um, here is an image, I'm pretty sure I got this from Wikipedia, but it, it shows um, sampling distributions for correlations of different sizes. Now these correlations, uh, these sampling distributions are based on samples that all have the same size, n equals 10, but you can see that the size of the correlation uh, is different, in, or I'm sorry, the size of the correlation affects the shape of the sampling distribution.
Now that said, if we focus on a correlation of a particular size, in this case the size is 0.50, and we look at the sampling distributions for samples of different size, we can see that with larger samples we get a sampling distribution that is more regular and normal shaped and less skewed and kind of odd looking. So in a sense the old adage applies that large samples really fix a lot of problems with sampling distributions, even in the case of an oddly behaved sampling distribution like that of a correlation. Um, however, you know, um, the important point is, unlike other calculations we could make, calculations like mean sampling distributions for means, sampling distributions for t-statistics, the sampling distributions for correlations depend on the size of the correlation uh, that we, uh, in the population, and that's, you know, again, potentially problematic. How we deal with this is we do a transformation. This is actually something that was developed by Fisher, so it's sometimes called the Fisher R to Z transformation, where we get a transformed Z value for R that's one half the natural log of the quotient of one plus the correlation over one minus the correlation. And the standard error for that transformed Z score has um, the calculation that you can see there, one uh, divided by the square root of N minus three. Now the math on the previous page may seem a little bit fussy, I mean, those natural logarithms can seem a bit intimidating, but it's actually not that hard to do this in Excel. I've typed in a function here that basically does, or not a function, a calculation here, that basically does just that. So I get my transformed value, and I get my uh, standard error of that transformed value. And what I've done here is I've kind of normalized or stabilized that sampling distribution. And now I can run a basic t-test like I would, with, or I'm sorry, a z-test like I would with almost any other z-test where I subtract <coughs> the expected value under the null distribution from the observed value, divide by the standard error, and that gives me a value for z which then I can find a probability value for. So here's my uh, quick calculation of the Z test statistic. And then here is my calculation of the probability value associated with that uh, test statistic. Now, although you can do this in Excel pretty easily, well, it's not that hard at least, I actually often use a number of different online stats tools for this. There are a number of little um, test statistic uh, distribution generators online. Here's just one that I've used. And you can see here that using a one-tailed test of significance, uh, I might conclude uh, that there's evidence to reject the null hypothesis, but under a two-tailed uh, test of significance, I might not. Now, we just did a z-test, but most uh, stats programs, at least the ones I can think of, use t-tests, which are work basically the same. We're just comparing, comparing an observed value to an expected value under the null distribution, which is usually zero, divided by the standard error of the test statistic. Um, this one's a little bit easier because it doesn't depend on that transformation first, but it gives us roughly the same results. Although here it's interesting to note that um, the test is significant using both a single-tailed test and a two-tailed test. So is an observed correlation significantly different from zero? Well, we could do a z-test or we could do a t-test. The t-test works pretty well with small samples and it's in some respects I suppose a little bit easier to use. Um, we could also ask is a correlation significantly different from any value? So if we have a particular value that we're interested in and we're trying to see is the correlation significantly different from 0.5 or from 0.3, uh, it's a little bit easier to implement that with a z-test. Um, z-test works a little bit better with larger samples, um, but they're both uh, pretty easy to use, e even though there is a little bit more effort with a z-test. Here's a chance to practice. If you're enrolled in my class, um, I have a fake set of data for you where I'm imagining that you're a health psychologist studying sleep quality. We've already computed the correlation. Now we're asking, is the correlation significantly different from zero? And I would just encourage you to try some different methods. Try doing a z-test, try doing a t-test, try doing some graphing, including using some of those links that I provided on Blackboard.
So along with testing uh, to see whether a correlation is significantly different from zero or different from a particular, a particular value, we can try to consider making confidence intervals for correlations, much as we would make confidence intervals for a mean or for many other types of calculations. Here, the fundamental idea is basically the same. We're trying to use a sample of data to make an inference about the population. For instance, making an inference about where in the population the correlation between two variables uh, lies. So if we made a 95% confidence interval, this is just a range of values that we figure has a 95% probability of containing a population value. And by 95% chance, I mean if we were to run uh, the study repeatedly, you know, repeatedly sampling the population, each time computing a correlation, and each time making a confidence interval, we reason that 95 out of 100 times that confidence interval would capture or would it sort of enclose the value for the correlation in the population. Now we don't run the study many, many times. We probably only run it once, but we hope or we reason that this once was one of those 95 out of 100 times that our confidence interval did capture the population value for the correlation. And we use basically the same approach that we might um, in uh, making confidence intervals for a mean, for making confidence intervals for that transformed value of the correlation. The only real challenge here, or at this point, is that those values are in a transformed metric that's a little bit tricky to think about. So we actually have to back transform them to regular old correlations using this formula here. Now, again, that's not that hard to do. Um, you could do it in Excel pretty easily. I've just gone ahead and done it right here. And we can see that our confidence interval uh, go, runs from negative six up to 0.99, so it's very wide, and uh, we might conclude uh, with this wide confidence interval overlaps with zero, our value for the correlation is not significantly different from zero. In this case, the standard error was very, very big because our sample size was very, very small. And if you recall uh, early, um, you know, quite a few slides back when I did the z-test uh, for our calculation, um, we decided that there, uh, that our um, correlation was not significantly different from zero, at least using a two-tailed test. And that's the uh, comparison here that we are getting with our confidence intervals. So although we computed a correlation that uh, seemed relatively high, uh, it was, gosh, what was it? It was something like, um, what was our correlation, 0.87. It turns out that that value is not significantly different from zero, probably because we had such a small sample. I think there were something like five people in our sample. For those of you who like Futurama, the cartoon, this reminds me of a quote, which I think, well, I don't know if this is from the cartoon or just someone made a quick meme, but it goes, your sample sizes are small, your standard deviations are high, we could substitute in here, your standard errors are high, your conclusions mean nothing, and you should feel bad. Well, you might not really need to feel bad, but you should be careful when trying to make inferences with small samples, because usually things like standard errors are really high, and things which look big or look significant might not be. So making confidence intervals with correlations is not really hard to do. Uh, you can do it in Excel with a little bit of manipulation of natural logarithms and so on. Uh, unfortunately, SPSS doesn't provide you an easier way to do this because there aren't pull-down menus that give you confidence intervals for correlations. At least I haven't found any that are easy to use. However, the author of our textbook, Andy Field, if you uh, have his textbook uh, and go to the website, or if you're enrolled in my class, of course, I've shared this with you on Blackboard, has some syntax which he has written, which makes it very easy to compute correlation, I'm sorry, confidence intervals for correlations. This also actually is a good way uh, or a good point in the class to introduce the whole idea of a syntax window. Um, some of you may know this already, others uh, this may be new to you. Um, SPSS has of course a data frame window, a window where we can look at different data sets. It has um, an output window where we can look at output from different analyses, and it has syntax windows where we can write code in SPSS's high-level programming language. Now back in the day, everything you needed to do in SPSS 
process had to be accomplished using code. Um, nowadays, many users uh, use mostly just the pull-down menus. Uh, I do that myself most of the time, but it is handy to be familiar with SPSS syntax because there are some things that you can only do in syntax, and being comfortable working with syntax actually can make you a much more powerful user. Now, it's not important that you understand all of what uh, Dr. Fields has written here uh, in his syntax, but if you have any familiarity or with programming, you can probably kind of take a look and eyeball some of these commands here. Even if not, you can recognize some bits of the calculation uh, from the uh, calculations that I've put on previous slides. Suffice it to say that how this works is you open up a data set and then you uh, plug in values for your correlations and then you run the syntax by highlighting it and pressing the little run triangle and it gives you confidence intervals which you can kind of see here although a little bit cut off in the output on the right side of the screen so i've input some different correlations and i've got back some confidence intervals and some z tests and some values for the probability associated with those z test values um, so it's actually fairly easy to use um, there are little online <coughs> tools that accomplish the same thing. If you just type in Google, you know, uh, if you Google search, you know, uh, confident, correlation confidence intervals app, um, you'll probably find one. I, I found one just a few minutes ago when I tried this. Whether you use SPSS syntax or use an online tool, um, here's a little practice example one more time. Again, we're imagining we're a health psychologist studying sleep particularly the relationship is between sleep quality and academic performance, we've already computed a correlation. Now just make the 95% confidence interval around that correlation. Try it using the syntax and see what you get. Okay, well assuming you did that now, uh, let's just finish up with a couple important points. Um, we sometimes want to test if a uh, a hypothesis about a correlation to see whether it's significantly different from zero or different from some other value. Um, this requires a little bit of extra work because of the nature of the sampling distribution for correlations. Um, that work also comes up if we want to make confidence intervals, but thankfully it's not all that hard to do. It can be accomplished in Excel using some calculations that you would enter or using SPSS syntax or taking advantage of the syntax that Andy Field wrote for his textbook. Uh, pretty easy to do. Okay, um, what have we learned? Well, correlation, it's just a standardized measure for a relationship that gives us both direction and magnitude. It's an effect size, that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, we can make confidence intervals, we can do hypothesis testing to see whether a correlation is significantly different from a given value. Often that given value is zero because we're trying to see if a correlation is significantly different from zero. Preview, what will we learn next time? Well more fun with correlations. This time we'll be comparing correlations to see if one correlation is significantly different from another correlation, and we'll consider some different types of correlations and how to calculate them. Okay, well, as I always say, thanks for your attention. I, I appreciate all the time people put into watching my videos. It takes me a while to make them, especially if it's a day like today where I make lots and lots of mistakes. But hopefully you're following along and you're learning something. Uh, if you have questions and you're in my class, of course, ask me. But if you're not in my class, you're just watching this stuff on YouTube, then post a comment and I'll, I'll do my best to note those comments and respond to them if I can, um, as soon as I can. So thanks, and uh, I'll see you next time.